Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy. Well folks, welcome back to Through a Scottish Prism. Great to have you back again. I hope you and yours are all well. Um, and uh, everything's going fine for you. I'm here in sunny downtown Dubai. Too hot for me, I'm telling you, too hot. Um, but there are bonuses, e.g. my grandchildren, etc. I've got a wee bit of a cold, so if I'm a wee bit blocked up today, I apologise. Um, but I'm joined today with one of my favourite guests. I've had him on before, and I'm sure we'll have him on again. Written some great articles uh, for myself, for Ian Lawson, and it's none other than Professor Alf Baird. Alf, welcome back to Through a Scottish Prism. Lovely to see you again. How are you? I'm fine, Roddy. How are you? Ah, well, apart from a wee bit of a cold, we're, we're fine. We're getting spoiled by grandchildren, so what's not to like? Um, it's quite appropriate today, actually. We're, we're doing this interview, ladies and gentlemen, on the 18th of September, the seventh anniversary of the terrible day where we had the opportunity for nationhood and we let it slip through our fingers. Um, so uh, there's mixed feelings today for me, Alf. I don't know about you, but thinking back seven years, it seems like 70 years as well as seven months the time flies and it's not been good time yeah it was a it was a it was a, an odd sort of day that mm. uh, the day after the it was like a wake i think somebody yeah. said it was like like the death of a nation mm. <laughs> uh, yeah. and i think a lot of people uh, were very adversely affected by that uh, psychologically mm -hmm. Uh, and I don't think that's really been analysed in any great depth. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I, I know people that actually affect, affected their careers, it affected their daily lives, it affected their future. Uh, they just couldn't uh, uh, attune to the to the disaster, as it were. So it affected a lot of people. And for my own part, that's what motivated me to write the book. You know, <laughs> the Dun Hodden. Get it up there, get it up there. Bit and, uh, there we go, Dun Hodden. Dun Hodden. And, and the, put together the framework because I was trying to figure out, you know, why is this? Is it just a case of uh, darling versus salmon? <laughs> or is there something deeper here? It's mm. it's not about personalities. It's about other things. And and really, yeah, I, 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 I listen to all sorts of voices, including Cambridge Analytica. Who came up with a key thing, which is it's to do with emotion, and as well as identity, and that's what I found in the research, and mm -hmm. what Edinburgh University found as well in the post-referendum research. It's all about identity and emotion, and when you mm -hmm. boil it down to it, it, came down to do you feel mere Scottish or mere British, mm -hmm. and that was it. And mm -hmm. how do you feel mere Scottish or mere British? Well, that's to do with your culture, your language, your socialisation, your background, your family your heritage, your history, all these aspects. It's nothing to do with the economy. Mm -hmm. And we had all these scare stories about pensions and currency and defence, EU. It was nothing to do with that. When it comes down to it, it's down to that thing, emotion. And it's about, do you feel more Scottish than British? And that mm -hmm. brings us back to the ethnic question. Mm -hmm. Well, you're right. It had a, an effect on lots of people and their lives and careers, etc. For me... On the 19th of September 2014 is when I decided to move to Catalonia. <laughs> and that's, you know, I, I'd been swithering well, I won't. And I knew that if we'd gone, yes, no, no way was I going to leave um, health or otherwise. But there we are. So we moved on from that. Um, and uh, we. We're now in this position where we're since that time we've had six mandates and no referendum and people are shouting for a referendum. But I'm now in the camp, uh, down to your good self, I'm in the camp now where I think a referendum is a mistake. I don't think it's the way to go. Um, and for the reasons that you have outlined both in your book and in subsequent articles and in our discussions. But there's people still resistant to that. Uh, very much of now on our uh, the, the fact of the matter is whether we like it or not not actually but Scotland is colonized it is a colony of the Greater England project now as you know from my blog a certain 
wonderful contributor to my, my blog, Gail Miller, gets very upset, and I understand why. You both actually agree. You're viciously agree or ferociously agreeing with each other, but coming from different angles. We are not a colony per se, but we are actually a colony, are we not? Yes. Well, what I found in the research was, yes, constitutionally we're not, but politically we are. Yes. And in all, in all, in all the terms of reality. And when you look at the definition of colonialism, it's not so much about settler occupation. It's more in, about political control and economic exploitation. You can have colonialism without settler occupation. That's, that's not the key factor here. The key factor is who controls your politics and your economy and who is plundering your, your economy while you're watching and leading to your inequality. And this can also lead to, well, colonialism also involves um, imperialism, which is cultural and linguistic. And Scotland has a long history of linguistic uh, and cultural oppression which is ongoing. Uh, the BBC is a great example. <laughs> but uh, the fact that people are deprived of their own language. So mm -hmm. we, I'm rediscovering Scots as I get older because it was driven out of me in primary school. Mm -hmm. You know, we go into schools as Scots bairns with a Scots tongue in our head, and it's driven out of us. We're made into Anglophones. Mm -hmm. And you have to ask yourself, why is that? And does it change our identity? And of course it does. And that's what it's, in, in, what it's designed to do. So imperialism, whether it's cultural, linguistic or any other form, is a form of oppression, as is colonialism, exploitation, political and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole range of things there which uh, reflect the fact that Scotland, yeah, constitutionally, we might say we're not uh, a colony, but that's kind of immaterial in re regard to how you've been treated for 300 years. Good. Well, I mean, if you've, if you've got to ask permission of your next door neighbour to hold a referendum to decide how you should be governed. That kind of says you're a colony. Well, that's to what me, Gareth anyway. Wardell said at the Alba conference. He said, you know, who makes the big decisions for Scotland? It's nobody in Scotland. It's not even Nicola Sturgeon. <laughs> uh, it's, it, it's somebody else. Uh, it's somebody out with Scotland. So all the key institutions and key organisations and the key policy decisions are not made by, by Scotland for Scotland. They're made elsewhere. Yeah. And of course, when you when you rear up against it or show an objection to it and say, well, I actually think we'd be better off looking after ourselves, you're immediately called a racist, anti-English. It's just because you hate the English. Say, no, 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 that's not what well, I'm saying. What I'm saying is I want us to take our decisions. I don't yeah. dislike them or I'm not anti them. I just yeah. think we should be pro us. Oh, no, you're a racist. And that's what they do to you. Yeah. Um, well, in, in the book, what I found was there are two forms of racism uh, affecting the Scots. And this goes back to uh, something uh, Gail mentioned about the colonial mindset. Mm -hmm. And in colonial, uh, post-colonial literature, the colonial mindset is, is a well-established uh, aspect of colonialism. Mm -hmm. The people, uh, the native people are told that they're inferior. Yeah. They're, they're informed that their culture is inferior. Their language is invalid. And if the language is invalid, the people become invalid. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you then recruit a meritocracy that reflects the cultural, uh, the superior culture, if you like, which mm -hmm. is Anglophone in our case. So this colonial mindset leads to that, what we call the cringe, but it's what I found it's defined in the science as internalized racism, mm -hmm. which is also known as appropriated, appropriated uh, racial oppression, where uh, uh, an oppressed people uh, regard their oppression as deserved. Now, mm -hmm. this is well established with with minorities around the world uh, wh wh who are who are marginalised, put to the side. Their language is marginalised, their culture, everything about them. So, w when we talk about a colonial mindset, we we are into the realms of some really interesting science. Uh, which, which, if you look at some of the post-colonial literature coming out of the African uh, colonization uh, and and independence movements, you 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 find that that basically uh, colonialism is regarded as a disease of the mind, mm -hmm. more than anything. It's also about political and economic exploitation, but it's also a disease of the mind, mm -hmm. which the colonized people have to cast out. They have to cast that out. But first of all, they have to understand what their oppression is about. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and this is what the point I was making in the article the other day, post the Alba conference, was if we're making a case for our freedom and our independence, we should really know what it's about. Mm -hmm. And fundamentally, it's about decolonization, which what the UN call independence. Yep. That's why they have a committee called the Decolonization Committee. Yep. You know, we're not actually saying anything new. So the forms of racism that affect uh, a colonized people uh, are one is internalized racism. The other factor here is that colonialism itself is racism. It's about making a culture and a language and a people inferior. Mm -hmm. And it's about putting in place a meritocracy that reflects the culture of the superior. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's why that's the root of our inequality. Yeah. And, and there's no point in just having, it's not on put, you're right. The point you make is it, it shouldn't be about independence for policies, e.g. five pounds in your pension, two pounds in your welfare check. It should be about, you know, colonization, language, culture, all those things. I like a good analogy, and the one I put is it's like, um, you know, the child who's being abused by Uncle Tim, and she goes to and says, well, you know, I don't like this, what Uncle Tim's doing. I went, you know, and you go, well, how can you say it about Uncle Tim? Uh, he's a good guy, he loves you, and takes good care of you, and gives you this, and presents, and nice, no, you'll be terrible, stop it, you're the bad person, he's fine. And that's what happens to us as soon as we say, well, no, this isn't right, what's happening to us, I don't like it, I don't want it to happen anymore, or continue. And you're told, no, you're the bad person. You mustn't complain. You're lucky. You're subsidised. You're, you know, we give you all these jobs. We let you, you know, have oil in your water. We let you have whiskey. We just well, the, money the, for the it. colonialism we methodology also means that the, the colonial power gives things now and again to the native people that makes them feel wanted, feel, <laughs> feel, feel that the colonial power is, 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 is a you know, is is looking after their interests in some mm -hmm. way, giving them little bits of crumbs off the table, as it were. But that's mm -hmm. pretty much all it is. Correct. And what, what we've got, Hollywood has become um, a colonial office. It really has. They have stopped actually progressing the case of radical Scottish independence and have become the, the, the governorship for English imperial rule. That's just the reality. I mean, people can deny it. They can call me what they like, say what they like. But that is the reality, is it not? Al? Well, in in the post-colonial literature, I'm sorry to keep harking back to it, no, but it's very, do, it's very interesting it. because it gives you the framework of what happens. Uh, and we have a template uh, for decolonization. And the first stages of the decolonization process is where the people vote for a, a dominant national party. They make that party dominant, but that national party has other interests in line, not just the people's interests, they, they have their own interests <laughs> to, to, to look after. And, and so then we get into the, the reality that the dominant national party reaches its own accommodation with the colonial power. Mm -hmm. And that's where we are with the SNP or the new SNP. They've reached that accommodation, uh, mm -hmm. which, which, which means they're not going to rock the boat too much. Uh, they're just mm -hmm. going to settle into that kind of equilibrium and independence is not a priority now. I think yeah. people in recent weeks have found that members of the SNP, a lot of them yourself, you've found as well, some members of the SNP don't prioritise independence anymore. Well, actually, I was going to say a few of the SNP members do prioritise independence now. Mm. It's the majority that don't. That's yeah. what I'm finding. Yeah, um, I, I think also in, post, in, in colonial, colonial, the colonial, post-colonial literature, what you also find is the different social groups in the society go into different, uh, different, uh, well, reflect different priorities. So you've got the bourgeoisie that's always gone into the pro-colonial camp, as it were. And we have that in Scotland uh, big time. But uh, then you've got the, the proletariat that because their salaries might depend on the colonial power, public sector pay and all the rest of it, a lot of them go into that camp. Uh, so that's pretty much more the middle classes. Mm -hmm. And then you've got, as well, but then you've got the lumpen proletariat. And I would say that's where the root of the independence movement is. Mm -hmm. It's what Alex Salmon found when he was talking about uh, Dundee in 2014. He was standing in Dundee and he said uh, on 12 Heads the other day, well, a while back, that people were queuing up to register to vote. And these, they were registering to vote for the first time ever. One guy hadn't registered to vote since the poll tax. They had just completely gone out of the way. 
And the reason they were registering the vote is because they said there was something to vote for. Yeah. Independence. Yeah. Up until then, there was nothing to vote for. And they haven't so, voted since. What you've got is it's the working class. The roots of the independence movement is the Scots speaking working class mm -hmm. that knows oppression. Yeah. We know oppression. You know, we've lived with gas meters, try to find a shilling and all the rest of it. We've lived with all that crap and you can't even. And, and people were brought up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. We and remember all that. And we're getting back to that now. We're getting back mm -hmm. to the poverty. We're getting back to the marginalization of groups uh, of Scottish working class, underclass, whatever you want to call it. We're getting back to that inequality. And it's I know from the university sector, having worked in it for 25 years, that that's one of the, the areas where inequality looms large, mm -hmm. where right. the elites get a free you know passage into the system uh, and and the, the, the working class can't get into it for, for a whole number of reasons. Yeah, yeah, uh, but they didn't have the opportunities. But anyway, what I'm saying is, if you look at the Alba audience and the Alba membership, it's now heading towards at root the the Scots speaking working class yeah. driving the boat. Yeah. Two things you, you've reminded me. I'm going to when I finish this interview, I'm going to go and speak to my grandchildren and see if they can believe me when I tell them that you used to have to find a fifty pence to get the TV working. <laughs> fifty pence in the TV. You remember the TV? I remember yeah. Them. Um, but the other one is that got me today, when it's a, a sort of a hot potato today of all days, where they've allowed, uh, I think it's 38 orange walks in Glasgow. And just going back to what you said there, those um, disgraceful um, spectacles, as I don't know what else I could call them, they allow them, they don't allow them to go through, they don't go through Newton Mearns or Bears Den or Broomhill or Hindland. You know, they go through the working class areas. Mm -hmm. Because they can have it, because the, you know, the middle class and the upper class, no, that's not for them. But it's the working class; they can take it. They can take the litter, and the violence, and the hatred, and all that stuff. And it is there is two laws, and we have to. You're right. We have to motivate the the poor. The other the other ones are going to benefit the most from independence. Now, when you and I spoke, we spoke about franchise at one point of our discussion, mm. and that has been a big bone of contention for a lot of people. Uh, and I'm totally on board. I agree with how it should be done through the UN decolon decolonization unit and that they should determine. Uh, my belief is that we should have a grand assembly, whatever you want to call it, when we recall our MPs, all MSPs, all councillors of all parties, and we say trade treaty of unions over, kaput, done. We're now going to start secession talks and we then go back to the people to ratify what we've done. And I would say those same people who agree to the cessation of the, the union are the ones who say, well, if someone's lived in Scotland for 2, 5, 10, 12, 17, 19 years, it's their primary home, they've had children here, they make that decision. I'm, I'm flexible in that. I'm just opposed to people who are doing a university course or who have a second home or who mm -hmm. are a soldier serving in Scotland for nine months of a year, but they get the vote. I'm against all that. So, but it's a bone of contention with people. But I don't know if you saw today uh, or yesterday, there was an article come out where they said, oh, no, it's all changed. The, the English incomers are now heading towards pro-independence with no real facts and figures to back it up. And when I asked for the data sets, they said, oh, they're there, you'll just look for them. I don't believe for a minute that that 72% has changed by much, do you? Well, it's not because, and the reason we know it's not is we know that the constituencies where the population is predominantly or has large uh, proportion of uh, rest UK population, and they all vote uh, unionists in, in recent elections as well. Mm -hmm. So if you look at constituencies in the borders, in Perthshire, in Orkney and Shetland, and certain other mm -hmm. areas. Edinburgh, <laughs> East Lothian, well, Edinburgh anyway, uh, in different areas, you'll find that it's very largely a unionist vote. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's where the population of people coming from rest of the UK live, mm -hmm. in these constituencies, by and large. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think that the, if they're voting for unionist parties, they're not going to vote for independence. Well, you <laughs> and that's so. what we found in the referendum survey as well. The, the Edinburgh mm -hmm. University post-referendum survey found the where there was uh, 
I wouldn't say enclaves, but where there was large English populations uh, in the borders, for example, and, and as I mentioned in Highlands and Islands uh, areas, certain areas, then uh, they mostly voted uh, against independence. Uh, I don't think that changes. Uh, the, the, it goes back to the, the key thing about identity, your national identity. What is your national? What is your identity? What is your emotion? Hmm. And if if the the vote on uh, nationhood is basically a, an emotional vote, uh, as Cambridge Analytica uh, talked about in many other. Uh, examples around the world where they've advised on as well, then that, that's that's the nuts and bolts of it. Uh, and and the post-referendum survey uh, came to the same conclusion. It was largely a vote of being either Scottish or British. Mm -hmm. And that's it. How do you feel? More British, more Scottish. And that's it. And obviously, if you come from another part of the UK, not Scotland, you're unlikely to vote uh, for Scottish citizenship. And that's the other thing about civic nationalism. What I found in, in my research was that civic nationalism depends on people having a sense of belonging to a country, mm -hmm. to that identity. Mm -hmm. That's what civic nationalism means. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, people coming here uh, from other countries and voting no means they don't want that citizenship. They're rejecting it. Not only that, they were blocking it for the locals. <laughs> mm -hmm. They were taking it upon themselves to prevent self-determination of the indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Some people might regard that as being a, quite a, an extreme uh, 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 action. So I think there's a lot to, to look into this. The other thing is identity doesn't change very easily. You know, when... Uh, just because the French colonized Algeria didn't make all the Algerians Frenchmen. <laughs> you know, and, and, and Irish, the Irish uh, say as well that uh, just because a England controlled Ireland for, for many centuries didn't make the Irish English. No. You don't change your identity so easily. It's not something that can be done unless you really want to. And that's where we get into the colonial literature about assimilation. Yeah. And cultural assimilation is about changing your identity. And this goes back to what I was saying about when Scots bairns go into schools and we get our Scots language driven out our heads mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and we're made into little aglophones. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for that. And it's yeah. to change your, uh, your identity and your yeah. culture and your way of thinking and your emotion to a national picture, a national entity. Now, there's two things. When, when people were rejected to me, saying, oh, how can you say that? Uh, we, you live in I wouldn't get a vote. I live in Catalonia, so I wouldn't get the vote. But mm. I, if I talk about Catalonian independence, I live there. I've chosen to live most of the year there. Not all the year, but most of the year I'm there. Um, and while I empathise with their position and sympathise with their position, I do not expect, and quite rightly, to be allowed to vote on it, to have a say in it. Mm. I pay taxes there. I live there. I've employed workmen there to do all sorts of stuff. I put money into the local economy, I'm paying taxes, but it's not my right to say how they should be governed. I've gone there to, for life reasons, whatever my reasons are, how dare I suggest that, well, I'm going to decide if you'll be governed from Barcelona or Madrid. But when you try and well, say that well, to Scottish people- Well, the, the UN there, seem quite clear on, on this as well. They talk about to, to, to prevent interference in self-determination and, uh, Interference includes interference by peoples of other nations mm -hmm. and other nationalities. And you're right. You know, I've worked in, in different parts of the world, Germany, Norway, Oman, Japan. I would never expect a vote on their sovereignty. No. And that's the other thing is uh, your vote on this question of independence. It's a question of sovereignty. And so your sovereignty is something that should be protected, not given away. And if we have to remember here in the other part of the book is about demographics and mm -hmm. our demographics are fundamentally changing mm -hmm. and have been changing for the last couple of hundred years, mm -hmm. quite significantly, with mostly Scots leaving and mostly people coming in from other countries, primarily from England. Now, that means that the demographics have fundamentally changed. The problem, the reason why other countries have uh, a national franchise, that's franchise only for nationals, is to protect their sovereignty. Yeah. Because if a country like Denmark, for example, had you know, a couple of million Germans suddenly appearing and they were all then given a vote on uh, Danish sovereignty, they might just say, well, we think Denmark should be part of Germany again. Yeah. 
you know, and uh, we think, if, you know, you should advertise all your best jobs in Berlin. And you, yeah. oh, by the way, you should speak German instead of Dan Danish, you know, yeah. get rid of your Danish language. Forget yeah. that. You know, so all of a sudden you see the picture. Uh, protection of sovereignty is fundamental to any nation. But with, without independence, Scotland has no protection of its sovereignty. So yeah. we talk a lot about sovereignty, but actually every day we're leaking sovereignty yeah. um, with an open franchise and with no control over population. Correct. We've got to do both. But there's another thing I was talking on the racism earlier and our identity being eroded. I noticed you had another very good article uh, in the Herald about the Scottish private schools who have been assuring parents from other parts of the country and from Scotland that their children won't end up with a Scottish accent if they go to the private schools in Scotland. I believe you put that in the, it was in the Herald today, I believe. It wasn't mine. It might have been uh, someone well, I know. a reference to you in it anyway. Um, but they were saying that they have, they have assured parents that they won't have a Scottish accent. Mm. And you're thinking, how... You know, why, well, why? actually, what this what this comes down to, Roddy, is 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 basically racism. We oh, don't talk so about it. Saying. We don't talk about uh, racism of the Scots or racism of indigenous peoples uh, and minority groups. And we have to remember, within the UK context, the Scots are a minority. Mm -hmm. And this is another point I raised in the article you published the other day was was that uh, the SNP had gone down the road of. Of, of prioritizing all sorts of minority interests and lobby groups behind them, like Stonewall and whatnot. Uh, whereas the, the rationale for independence is the protection of the rights of a minority people, which is the Scots as a whole, the Scottish mm -hmm. people. And they are a minority ethnic group within the UK. Mm -hmm. And that their, it's their sovereignty that's at, at, at question here. So we have to think about this in a different way. And that's why I think my point to the ALBA group was because they were keen on setting up different groups for this and that, a bit like the SNP, and changing the focus to also different sort of policy objectives, uh, which gets us, gets us away from independence. Yeah. Independence is a special purpose, mm -hmm. which means to me that instead of a mainstream political party, we need a special purpose vehicle. Yeah. You need a, a political entity that's geared towards independence and then delivering that independence in the early stages and making sure it works effectively. Yeah. Because the other thing, yeah, there's a, there's, there's a number of issues that have to be addressed uh, when a country obviously uh, escapes from its oppressor. Mm. <laughs> uh, it has to put in place systems and processes and make sure that the integrity of that new state is protected and respected. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, that's the focus we have to do, not on objectives for this and that and laws for this and that. This yeah, is where Hollywood's gone in a different direction. It's gone, it's gone law mad, <laughs> law yeah. crazy, uh, yeah. because it's lost its focus. Yeah. Its Indeed. focus should have been on independence, liberation, freedom, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. but it should have been on that fundamental change. Instead, it's gone in a whole different host of areas in the post-colonial literature, they call that mystification. Yeah. It mystifies the people <laughs> Be mystifies because they've, they've lost their objective and they're gone in all different areas and they're telling the people, we have to do this, we have to do that, we have to do this and that. And and they're forgetting the, the focus. They're forgetting their main purpose. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I would class myself my whole life as a hardcore independent Easter. And I never have been hardcore thinking, well, I can get a better pension or I could get better welfare, or I could be, you know, a wee bit better off. It never crossed my mind, never. Um, it is the, the de democratic, the, the, the fact that we could make decisions mm. for ourselves and not have someone else make for them. I, yeah. I mean, if you ask the question, is Scotland a nation? And the answer, well, yes, it is. So why are you allowing another nation to rule it? That's not normal. It's, it's dependence that's abnormal, not independence that's abnormal. Yeah. And that's the message we need to get out to the people of Scotland. Mm -hmm. And we haven't, we've got to stop being scared of calling out what's happening, calling it racism, you know, being subjected. And, you know, if someone's siding with the other side, what does that make them? That does make them a traitor. And if you use that, oh, you can't call them traitors. Well, what do you call them? 
what, what should we call them? Yeah, well, well this is it. In, in colonialism, there's always groups that will undermine liberation. Mm. Always groups. Uh, I mean, Africa is full, full of examples where you stick a few dollars in the wee laddie's hand, he'll pull out a gun. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that's how crazy the situation is in some places where poverty really is bad. Uh, but we have to, I think, uh, understand what independence really is. And that was the point of the article. You have to understand what independence is. And we then get into the realms of the UN decolonization process, which is yeah. what independence is. Uh, and and that's the reality of the situation. Constitutionally, of course, your 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 friend Gail has argued that we 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 need to talk about sovereignty, which is fine. Uh, but the likelihood is that's that would end up in courts, probably. And you can never really uh, guarantee a, a good outcome. Certainly not in a Scottish court. <laughs> never mind a UK court. And the other point about international law is that quite a few countries don't uh, adhere to international law. The UK is one of them. Mm -hmm. So we ha you have to be careful what's, what's, what's being done there. Uh, and I think the, the route to independence is much more in line with what Albert were suggesting about a plebiscite uh, and, and taking it from there and seeing how that goes and whether that can be effectively done. Uh, the UN option then comes in, in if that is blocked somehow. Mm -hmm. And then we really in, are into uh, the, the force of colonialism. Colonialism really is force. And if the UK government was to try and block the UN coming in, um, because let's be honest, you, you can't, was it someone, the famous man that said, you can't look forward without looking back. Um, London, the Westminster, the English government has always tended to you know, overreact uh, mm. and lose. They always lose, but they overreact. Now, if they were to say, no, we're not allowing the UN in, what then? Well, I think independence happens with, uh, certainly in post-colonial literature, it happens when the, the, the administrative power or the colonial power gives up, basically. It's not worth, it's not worth the hassle. It's yeah. no longer worth the hassle. So I think what, what Alba has to do is, and what the people have to do is keep at it, keep Adjusted. going. If anything, intensify, uh, you know, the, the 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 strategy, the demonstrations. In a sense, I know that post COVID and COVID prevented a lot of that, but that's that's keeping it a high on the agenda. Of course, they're able to keep it out of the media. They're able to keep a lot of the the momentum out of the mainstream media, which is to their advantage. Uh, but the alternative media, such as yourself and and, and others, uh, which is under attack, and that's another feature. <laughs> that's another feature of colonial oppression, hmm. is uh, the anti-colonial movement uh, will always be uh, will will always be blocked in my, in any way that the colonial power can do, and that's what they're doing with Craig yeah. Murray as well, particularly. Absolutely. Um, what, what's annoying is when some so-called independent Easter MPs and MSPs are attacking the pro-independence media. I, I, I well, the, what, again, going back to the post-colonial literature, what the dominant national party is usually regarded as in, in, in the decolonization process is a gang. Hmm. They're basically a gang. <laughs> uh, and, and that's how they act. They're, they're there for their own advantage. They're not sure. there for the betterment of the people. They're no, no longer representing the people's interests. No, uh, we gave true. them the last throw of the dice in May. Yeah, That was the last. And it was only because Alex said, you know, back them. Yeah. And we did the SNP Alba, a lot of us. Yeah. Uh, never happened again. Be for one or reason or another, it never happened. But the what we could see is that's the last chance saloon for them. Mm. Uh, they're going to become like Labour <laughs> yep. pretty quick, I would imagine, because yep. we didn't have a lot of time. Nope. And uh, the sooner that they disappear, the better, If either through elections or other means. But nope. we have to have fundamental change. I agree. I, I was talking about this in another programme last night, and, and I think 2024, 23, whenever the next UK general election comes along, I think it's likely to be 23. Because um, they're putting through a new something through Westminster just now, which will effectively get rid of the 
I forgot what you call that bill again. Um, but, but they can it'll go back to Prime Minister being able to call an election whenever he wants again. And I think he's likely to go in 23. Um, and when they do, what's well, one, it's an excuse not to another referendum for the SNP. But I think that's when Alapa has to make its big move and it either takes over from the SNP or removes the SNP. And we have to start building after that general election up again. But the SNP are no longer, in my opinion, long term, no. can be part of this, uh, this, 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 this quest. They have, they have given up the right to lead the yeah. movement. They have betrayed yeah, they, the movement. They, don't, they, they no longer talk the independence. Uh, no. Sad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they, they talk about everything else, but, but independence. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so. and, and I speak as someone who joined the party in 1968. It breaks my heart. But I suppose yeah. that the Labour Party, you know, who've been talking about abolishing the House of Lords since, I don't know, since they came yeah. into being, and they never did. And they used to, they used to be socialist. You know, they used to be socialist. The Labour Party, did you know? That? <laughs> that's honest. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's the, that's the other thing about about independence. It's it's neither about right or left. No. Uh, and this is what the post-colonial literature tells you a bit about as well. Socialists, uh, well, people of the left, even amongst the colonizer, will often want to be part of that process of liberation, mm -hmm. but they soon realize that it's not a, a matter of social policies. Uh, it's not a matter of political ideology. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's about liberation of a people. Yeah. And that's what has to be done first before anything else. Yeah. Uh, so that's, I think that's where the focus of ALBA has to be with the caveat that other policies have to be in place that will ease the process. Mm -hmm. Because when you're changing an organization, I look at Scotland like an organization. Like if I'm studying a business organization, as I yeah. used to do <laughs> one time for a living, but the, it's like a, 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 an organization. It needs a strategy. It needs a structure, but it needs to have a focus on its key objective. Mm -hmm. And if it gets diverted on all different other objectives, then it will lose its focus. Mm -hmm. It also has, has to have the, the right people in place. And I think with Alex Salmon and other people and Chris McElhinney, he's got the right, he's getting together the right group and Kenny McCaskill and so on, and yourself on the NEC. Oh, you have two kinds of. He's, he's got that nucleus, and there's so many other people, great speakers at the conference. Oh, it was fabulous. That, that we can identify with in, 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 a, in, a, in a Scottish sense, even in a Scottish ethnic sense. <laughs> but, but that's what independence is about it's about us. It's not about yeah. another folk. It's nothing to do with the colonizer. No. And it's their about, feelings. If their feelings get upset, tough luck. Well, that's right. That's right. It's it's, it's and and the, going back to the franchise, the New Caledonia franchise was interesting mm -hmm. as well because quite a lot of residents who had maybe come out there from France for the good life and so on, <laughs> uh, they, they were told that they couldn't vote unless they had been there for the last uh, last referendum in the nineteen nineties. Mm -hmm. or a previous referendum. So the, the length of residence uh, might actually need to be longer than some people think. Yeah. Sorry Especially when there. we're talking about quite a substantial population change. Sorry, I'm coughing away here like a madman. Uh, <laughs> which I'm just as well we're coming towards the end because my cough is beginning to catch up on me again. Um, and originally I'd brought... <coughs> excuse me to speak about free ports, but we'll have to do that at another time. Mm. Um, just going on as a last thought, Al, what would you like to see happen? If you were, if Alec Salmon phoned you up tomorrow and said, listen, I want you to take over tomorrow, Alf, the party have agreed. What would you like to see put in place to get us to the next the next layer, the next level? Well, I, I think what the, the recent series of papers I, I published with uh, Ian Lawson on News for Scotland, there was a a call there for some of these papers to be put together in a booklet, which I'm hopefully working towards. But uh, that brings brings me to to Alex's strategy on it. I do think that uh, he needs a booklet as such, and and he's talking about Rob, Robin McAlpine and and Stuart Campbell collaborating to do that. But I think they really need to also have a focus on informing the population what independence really is, uh, and it's not it's not about political choices on this and that. It is about 
liberation of a people from oppression uh, and 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 decolonization as well. So uh, I think they have to focus on that to some extent. I think there there is a, a a need to explain to the people the reality of their their state, <laughs> if you like, uh, and and we shouldn't be embarrassed by uh, the term colonialism. No, nope. we should be, be disgusted by it. You know, yeah. because it's 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 a scourge. It's a form of punishment. Mm -hmm. That's what the UN describe it as. And that's why they develop the self-determination process, so people can free themselves from the scourge of oppression. And that's what we have. And that's why we're always looking over our shoulder to the big decision maker who is not in our country. And we need to stop that. Maybe myself and my fellow bloggers need to think about crowdfunding this pamphlet of yours <laughs> to, put out, um, to talk about colonialism and what independence is really all about. We shall see. That's maybe a discussion for another day. Alf, I've got to thank you. I can't, I know I've actually overrun and Techie will be giving me into trouble. It takes you strictly 30 minutes. It's, well, it's nice speaking to you again, Roddy. Oh, it's always a pleasure. It's never a chore, Alf. Never a always chore. Always remember, Dubai was a former colony and it's got these great big dry docks now and a big container terminal. Yeah, I mean, you look at this. Well, I want next time you come on, we'll talk about ports because it's really something that I'm, I'm yeah. very interested to get. The old Baltic ports going again, but yeah, you know, well, I, I always is, say, I remember is the one trade time, and trade is the economy. Absolutely, there was one time I was in my my local pub in Barhead, and one of the lads came up to me and he said, "You go to Dubai a lot, don't you?" I said, "Yeah, yeah I go there. My, my, my kids and grandkids are there." I said, "I've just got a cracking holiday out there, dirt cheap." So well, who are you? he says, "Oh, I'm an airline, right from Glasgow." And he told me I can't remember what the price was, but it was really. I said, "That is reasonable." He said, "How long are you going for?" He said, "A fortnight." I said, when are you going? <laughs> he said, July, fair fortnight. Oh, no, oh dear. <laughs> I said, uh, I now know why you got it cheap. And it was actually <laughs> the time when Ramadan was right in the bang in the middle of the Glasgow Fair. Yeah. And, he, and, he, and I said, oh, you're not going to look. Oh, he said, oh, I love the heat. I love the heat. I said, no. <laughs> he came back in. He was whiter than me when he came back in. He, <laughs> and he said, oh, he said, it was murder. <laughs> Um, and I'm here in September, heading towards October, and it's still, it's, hmm. I'm, I'm hardly out the door. It's too bloody hard. I've got this bloody cold because of the air conditioning. Anyway, I'm digressing and I'm overshooting. I know Techie in the background is going mental. Alf, hmm. it's been great. Um, thank you for everything. And thank you for everything you do. It is vital. And uh, I know it, it changed my perception. And I hope now I can help change other people's perception. Um, and I hope we can all work collectively to do that. And I'm not kidding about maybe we need to think about that pamphlet. Um, <laughs> beside the wee, the wee Alba book, um, to get one of those in. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm liking that idea. But anyway, thank you, Alf. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've enjoyed uh, Alf and what he's had to say as much as I have. And until I speak to you all again, you know what to do. You and yours, please, please, take care. Bye now. Bye. Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy.